All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. Yes, everyone, I am back. Daddy's back, kind of, <laughs> sort of, yes. Surprise, surprise, look who's home. Yeah, kid, you know, I couldn't just leave. I must tell you, I watched the show, and I'm thinking, Kim is alone. How yeah. can you leave her like that? Kim, how are you? It's wouldn't not it, right. Wouldn't it be the first time a girl got ditched? So, I mean, literally, I just got in off the dock. And I thought I've got to give her something. You got to give her some chit chit chit. So I am here, and we have a special show for you today. Rothman will be through talking politics. Kim will do that interview, and then I'll tell you what I did, Kim. What you do? I thought there's something special that we have in the Mark Thompson Show vault. Yeah. That needs to come out right now. It's a holiday special. Yes, it's a. Here's the reason yeah, that this place is fun. Exactly. We have a fun, long interview. I said, I'm dedicating the length, the lengthiest interview we've got to Lori. Yeah, lo- listener Lori. Joe Box and Little Anthony. Oh, and also Joe Box and Little Anthony. And what we'll do is. We will run in on its entirety. In fact, Kim calls me and goes, hey, man, just so you know, this uh, interview you did with the manager of the Doors, and it's all about Jim Morrison and uh, the group America and Crosby, Stills, and Nash, you know, it's pretty cool, but it runs an hour and whatever. What did you tell me? One hour hour and and 12 minutes. An hour and 12 minutes. Yeah. So I said, well, what? uh, Yeah, it's a longer uh, interview. (laughs) So I said, um, well, let's check with Lori. Yeah. Because listener Lori doesn't like the long interviews at all. Right. And uh, we couldn't reach her. And so we had to make the decision without her. And we decided that uh, we're going to do it. We're doing it. We're going to do it. We're going to run it in its entirety. It's good. It's good. I'm going to pop up right in the middle, though, with some news. Oh, that's cool. That's and then we're very, going very right cool. back into it. Yeah. All right. That's no, 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 no. <laughs> and then that, and then we so are. Long, we need an intermission. That's how long. Yeah, it, it is. It is long, and it does need some news in the middle. So I yeah. think it's really, really cool that you'll be doing that. Kim, how are you? So what we'll shoot for is a special. And it's the holidays, and people are on different schedules, et cetera. And I really think, you know, Jim Morrison was a transformative performer. And the doors came at a time when music was changing in so many ways and the culture was changing in so many ways, you know? Right. So uh, I think this is really a fun conversation and we've been sitting on it for a while. And so we are running it in its entirety. And, and again, Kim and I discussed, we could break it up into two parts. You could break it up into three parts. You could break it up into five parts. You could do 30 parts. No, we're going to run the whole thing today. And I think it'll be I fun. Mean- I put the decision on your shoulders because if I did it without a break or if I did it with a break or if I broke it up into two separate days, I thought no matter what decision I make, I'm going to hear about it. So I might as well let him <laughs> him choose. That way he gets to pick and I don't have to be the, on the receiving end of that baloney. I, yeah, we, uh, well. We'll do it live. I can tell <laughs> it and we'll do, do it, it live. live. We did it um, kind of on the fly. Bill Siddons is his name, and Bill Siddons, uh, again, ended up as the manager of the Doors. How he ended up as the manager of the Doors is kind of interesting. So it's all included in in the thing. And, and he's not wasn't just the manager of the Doors. You said you told me he was the manager of Oingo Boingo. Yeah, Oingo and Boingo, Crosby, America, Nash. Uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash. So yeah, yeah. He, he's really a guy. But I I think we, as I recall, talk about the Doors a lot. So um, I just I loved how. And love how completely uh, dominant the Doors were at the time. I mean, Morrison was like a larger-than-life, almost mythical rock star figure. And the Doors had that. Uh, and so for that reason, I, I kind of focused on that and, and the time, as I recall. Yeah. But um, And or, people's origin stories are always interesting to me. So 
Um, so we'll get into to that. Anyway, that's to come after uh, after Rothman. I also have uh, something I'm not. I, yeah. The Mark Thompson Show. I also wanted to share with you, Kim, uh, a little something from the ship, if I Ooh, could. Please tell me about your trip. I've just gotten off a cruise ship. And first of all, a lot of people don't like cruise ships. I feel like we need I, some, some music, some some ship music or some story music. Oh, really? I don't have any ship music or story. Do you have it? When I just got off the ship. Like I, oh, we, I see. Yeah, that would be good. Well, yeah. you know, these... Um, these real-time notes are helpful, Kim, but it's better if you talk to me uh, maybe before the show. Oh, my God. I don't know. There's nothing I no can music. do. No music. I guess we're not having music. Um, okay. I don't have any, and my computer is down. My, You know my whole system is down point. here on, you know. I'm so disappointed. Already, Kim, I'm disappointed in get this it, story. Kim. How can Carry you? On. I mean, uh, it's... Mark, it's before you start, it would really be helpful if you had any music of some kind, maybe story music or... Is that uh, how I? Is that how I music, talk? That's exactly how I said it. Boat music. Do you have anything like that? <laughs> uh, no, Kim, I don't. Um, wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. <sighs> anyway. So you just got off the boat. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, just got off the boat. I'll shorten this, and <laughs> we'll do a longer version of the story when I have boat music or story music. Okay. Excellent. But for now, I'll just mention that. <laughs> I, it was a, I enjoyed the ship and I think there's a lot to be said for you. I know, you know, floating Petri dish, Mark, oh my God, how could you even get on there? It's one big disease. Well, we've been on a bunch of them. I didn't like cruises. I think I've mentioned this before. And then we took one to Alaska because we were given one as a gift and we went to Alaska and we liked it so much. We were dreading it. Because they thought, oh my God, we don't like cruises, but cruises yeah. and whatever. All the things that people say, Petri dish, blah, blah, blah. Right. Three days in, we're planning our second cruise. We loved wow. it. And since then, we've really looked forward to it. We, But we try to be tactical about where we're going and all this sort of thing. Anyway, uh, we had a great time. It was a long one. It was through Central America and South America. Mm -hmm. So Ecuador and Guatemala and Peru and Chile through Mexico as well. So there was a, a lot that was covered. And by the way, it's a long way. I mean, I literally just flew in earlier, just a few hours ago. And oh, a few hours ago, well, 10 hours ago, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it was a, I think the actual flight time was like 12 hours. That's I mean, it a takes you flight. 12 mm -hmm. hours in the air to get back to Southern California. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the only thing I'm going to give you the stuff that didn't work, then I'll okay. tell you about the great, the great <laughs> stuff later. And I've got visuals to give you, and then we'll you, get that. Yeah. Cause we'll, you didn't want to go on this cruise. No, I did not. I did not you ever get over that and like, it, you know, start to relax a little bit? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, I like to stay connected. I like to, to read what's going on. I like to, you know, I like to, to watch stuff. I like to, you know, so it was hard for me, but they did have the, um, internet troubled as it was on the ship was still good enough that I could kind of, you know, kind of make it. And what can you tell us about the scene? <laughs> it's a tough internet, Larry, but there was a buffet. What can you tell us about the scene? The buffet was amazing, Larry. The buffet uh, looked like, and again, uh, then I'll move on to the negative stuff, and then I'll come back with a little bit more in the way of detail, and we'll bring Courtney in, and we'll have music, like, you know, boat music yeah, yeah. or story right. music. Yeah, a, a jaunty little boat tune. Oh, Excellent. okay. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll try to maybe run it past you, Kim, because you yeah, seem to uh, <laughs> have settled into your role as host in a, a very <laughs> a strong way. So I... I like being little screen again. I like being a little square. Trust well, me. I yeah I get it. Kim, how are you? Yeah. So what I'm what I'm getting at though in talking with the buffet, and you're probably aware of this, is I've never seen anything like this. Um, where's uh never We've seen never anything seen like anything it? Anything like this? Is there? Don't we have it? Where is it? Uh, nobody has ever seen. Nobody has ever put something yeah. like this together I mean, that I've ever. The buffet is really There's never been anything like this. Thank you. you that's go. what I wanted. The buffet was like they were 
throwing a wedding reception at yeah. every meal. Yeah. You know, I don't eat a lot of desserts because I'm vegan, as you know. I don't, I don't butter and cheese I avoid. But there were, I mean, cakes and pies and desserts and pretty fours and with such gorgeous presentation, it looked like it was a shoot for food and wine. It was mm -hmm. insane at every meal. So it plays to all of your worst instincts. I'm telling you, I did two things. I drank and I ate. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is I gambled, right? So those are all my worst instincts. Yeah. And I just turned into this lazy dude who couldn't <laughs> wait for the buffet to open up. I mean, it was, cr I mean, seriously, hey, I was eating at, I'm, I'm eating at 1245 at night. Oh my goodness. Like every night, like yeah. I'm, I'm anxiously, you know, does the buffet not close at like after dinner? It closes hour? at, it closes at one. Oh my goodness. So what you're gambling and then you wander down to the buffet pasta. I had pasta little... every night. It was oh. brutal anyway. Um, so I'm going to get in, I'm going the other way in the new year. I'm, I'm working out, I'm doubling my workouts. I'm mm -hmm. going to try to get into some yoga. We'll see how long that lasts. But bottom line is if you're into decadence, the cruise is the thing for you. I mean, it is. And, and I was, and I was hip deep in it. So at the end of the cruise, the very end, we land and dock in a place called Valparaiso. Okay, it's in Chile. It's a port town like San Francisco in that there are these hills and dramatic landscapes with huge art communities and there's all of this art on the streets. I mean, I'm talking about the, the houses with the kind of like street art, graffiti art everywhere. And it's kind of shocking, but it really is beautiful. And Courtney got some art there and, and all this kind of thing. You know, Courtney's very much into art. So... They tell you the night before, this story may not mean anything to you, and I'm sorry to, to bore the audience, but no, it, to me it was on. wild. Okay. But we had a separation in my family in that Courtney didn't do this and I did do this. We were told to get your bags and put them in the hallway and appropriately tag them, your luggage, right. and then they, it will be picked up by the luggage people and then placed for you on the dock in the morning when we dock in Valparaiso. Valparaiso, I think is it. So I did it. I packed my bags, two huge bags. I overpacked, I, which I tend to do, but I really did it on this because I don't have to fly anywhere. I can just dump it. You know, I don't need to make sure that it weighs this much or whatever. See, we're all confused by it because to us, you wear the same jacket every day. Why are you overpacking? And it makes no sense that I would overpack because I basically do wear the same thing every day. It makes no sense. Nothing in my life makes sense. So but you did, and there I, go your But I thought you always go, well, hall. let's see, at the gym, yeah. maybe I want another pair of, uh, you know, whatever, jersey shorts sure. and whatever. Yeah. So I put the stuff out, I pack it up and appropriately tag it and leave it outside the room. Courtney says, I'm just going to do it in the morning. I don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to drag it off the ship myself. I said, Okay. Usually she's the one who has her act together. In this case, I'm the one who got it out. The next morning, we run to breakfast. Everything's like really very harried, and we get off the ship, and my bags are gone. They're not there. They're not there in the numbered aisle, and they're not there anywhere in the terminal. So, and I must tell you, it's 80 feet from the room. I mean, it's not like they were going, well, they had to be trucked across this other place and then they transferred to buses. No, they take it off the ship and they put it right there at the dock. Do you think someone stole stole it from the hallway? No, there's nothing. No, I mean, no. Took it, took it to their own room, rifled And they're the not nice they bags. Want, like, you know, maybe at their, no, my bags are beat up. Okay. You know. Um, it didn't have the look of, I want this. No, exactly. That's got some good stuff inside. And even if you cracked it open, it's got, you know, what? Like, you know, a bunch of Banana Republic pants and, you know, like, I'm, look at me. I'm, you know, it's not, there's nothing in there you want. Yeah. But as it turns out, I'd put some liquor and gifts in there, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway, bottom line is 
never recovered. And I haven't heard from the cruise line. And I filled out a thing. They tell you, well, go online right now. And, you know, and so I filed a report. I had pictures of the bags. It's a rookie mistake, though, man. It's a little oh. bit my fault. I didn't put the air tags in the bag, which I should have done. Mm. Um, I'm a little angry at myself. But I mean, you know what the bummer part of that is, is you pack the stuff that you love, right? Right. The stuff that you don't want to be without, like your favorite shorts, your favorite swim trunks, your favorite everything. So when when your luggage that you take on a trip disappears, it's all your best things. No, you're right. You're right. The stuff that you're comfortable with. That's Mm -hmm. a really good point. So um, and then I had two days where I'm in the same pants and, you know, whatever. I quickly went and bought then we went to santiago and in santiago is a big city i went to you know i I got another shirt got another and you know i was able to you know get another pair of underwear and all that stuff and uh then finally we went and santiago is great although it's christmas you know so there the streets are not a lot of things are open i'm going to go back there when it's you know the museum is fascinating that's something for another time really fascinating art museum and um and I just liked it. They, the Chilean people speak Spanish so quickly, though. I mean, I couldn't understand anything. It was like trying to follow a Formula One race. You know, it was just like, oh, my God. It's like, And because I speak, I think, well enough, and the way I say the words, it was what David Katz said. He said, oh, Mark, the way you speak, people are going to think you speak. Right. And, man, they just blew me out. It was, I'm telling you, it was like a tidal wave of words coming up. I was yep. like, whoa. So, anyway. Um, we had a couple of days where I was, you know, knocking around with that. And then they, uh, came and pick us up, took us to the airport. The flight back was terrific. Now I've, I had to buy a temporary bag where we, you know, cause my bag was gone where we put a lot of stuff, Courtney and I doing well, get on the flight. It's the nonstop again, long flight, but biggest thing was that I couldn't see the Niners game. I oh, wanted to see yeah. the Niners game. So I saw little highlights on Twitter while I was waiting on the tarmac because there was still enough cell service for me to see it. So I saw the interceptions and I saw mm. the opening drive. So I saw it, it looked like it was going to get ugly. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, so I didn't feel quite as bad about missing, you know, the gangland slaying that was that Niners game. Um, anyway, I crack open the ipad it's one it's those lie down seats watching maestro which is the new movie with bradley oh Cooper. how was it did you like it uh i actually liked it first 20 minutes and then i fell asleep oh <laughs> well the flight didn't leave till 1 a.m yeah so uh when i woke up i thought oh my god where's the ipad I didn't sleep long, just a couple hours. Couldn't find it anywhere. It's dark on the in the cabin. I thought I'll go get it later. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it, and realized it had slipped under the seat where it had uh when you move the seat back and forth, it had wedged itself in there. Uh-oh. Right? And when you move it, what happens? It cracked. Did it crack? Oh, it blew up. Oh, it bl- no. not not blew up by the way they worry about it really blowing up it cracked badly i wish i had it here maybe you know what else um, could go wrong well at least there wasn't a plane crash look at that that's i mean i did feel like it, uh, by the way it, it really <laughs> doesn't you know but yeah. because it cracked and was so cracked uh, first of all it took like two people to find it. it it was i think a courtney and i between us found it and then the different flight attendants came over to try to get it. They couldn't reach down there. So they said, oh. you'll have to wait until everybody's off the flight and then engineers will come on and we'll move the seat and be able to get it. Yeah. I said, okay. So then as we're landing, we're about 20 minutes out of landing and they're telling you to put your seat belts on. The seat belt has also wedged in there. Like the whole, like these two Uh-oh. things dropped in. One of them was, and I can't move the seat because they're worried that if I move the seat, the iPad will explode, and the explosion sure. can cause a fire. Yeah. So this is high drama. I'm telling you, it was like everything was just going south, and this is my birthday at that right. It's <laughs> the, this today is when we're doing this. The, the day <laughs> yeah. after Christmas, my birthday. So 
we're landing and it's the morning of my birthday and not that, that matters but it was just kind of funny i always have this thing about birthday thank you birthday christmas yeah. uh, fourth of july these are holidays you just want to avoid being out man bad stuff happens like i just just you know anyway so to make a long story longer <laughs> they uh said i'm sorry sir but because you're seat belt is wedged there in the seat and we can't move the seat because of the ipad situation you're gonna have to move from your spacious lie down seat back to the back of the plane uh -huh. to uh you know what i thought okay fine it's i mean it's only like, but it was just kind of funny i felt like yeah. i've been exiled you know <laughs> what i mean um but and i'm such a baby like like it didn't bother me i must tell you i wish yeah. you could say oh it bothers me so much i shouldn't you know but um I just, I just thought it was great. It was like, it was like, okay. And then I go back to the seat once the plane has landed and now I'm waiting and everybody gets off the plane and it was just kind of funny. Then the whole crew is there and these engineers come in, they all speak Spanish. So it was kind of the last bit for me of South America. It was in a weird, I hate to say I liked it, but I love hearing all these guys speaking Spanish. And then I said in Spanish, this is a tough way to make friends, but it's nice to meet everybody and thank you. And uh, and then I have this iPad that's broken into a million pieces and it's kind yeah. of worthless now. But um, but that was the whole deal at, on for the last couple of days anyway. So yeah. lost luggage, you oh, know, man. iPad lost. And, yeah. Okay, and the final what was, indignity. Yeah. What was the best best moment of the whole trip? Oh, that's we're a gonna, great question. We're going to end this on a positive note here. Yeah, that's not really my style to do that, but um, <laughs> we're going to try. I, I no, no, no. <laughs> I <laughs> the best moment. Um, I'll tell you one thing. They had some great lectures on board the ship. I really love those I mean, on off, natural history. Off the ship. Off the ship, but was the best, the, best moment. I mean, you know, when you go to travel, why not? I get could be. I can't on the get ship. past the buffet. It was so good. <laughs> Does it have to be off the ship? No, it doesn't. Maybe you, um, maybe you just really love the lecture series. That's good. I well, I I don't know. What, what can you tell us about the scene? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the scene, Larry. Did you see uh, your wildlife? I mean, was there something that? What was the best? Like, what was the best moment of the trip, honey? Was there something breathtaking that you saw? Whales um, leaping from the sea against a sunset. No, none it wasn't. Of this. It wasn't really that kind of. Um, what, what what was the best? Yeah, Kim's asking what the best moment of the trip was. Uh, Courtney's here. Um, that might be on, honey. Try, try you can jump. Hello. On. Yeah. Hi, I can hear you. Hi. What Hi. was the best moment of the trip? Oh, there, there were so many. Were there? Yeah. I can't even think of one. <laughs> <laughs> what? well i mean you're still recovering from i think when we got to land things mm. changed for mark okay things um, got worse yeah they got yeah. worse right but um i don't know i mean I kim's have... asking me uh what I've... about on land what was the best thing on, on land i didn't do well yeah no. no 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 mark uh no it just got worse uh -oh. including the ipad today i told her I thought, the ipad story i thought maybe oh, there was great. some type of excursion that happened or you know some beautiful breathtaking vista some moment where <laughs> you guys went oh this is what it's yeah, all she about she really has oh. a, she has a whole different life yeah, in her no. mind Did yeah you? i come yeah. from regular stock <laughs> yeah we come from regular stock <laughs> no. we don't really yeah like yeah. we i know in three weeks there was none of that no it was it was great <laughs> i mean i like in like in um in uh was it Cabo, we went to Flora Farms, and that was oh, stunning. that was cool. So and they stop in Cabo, and, I, and this is a thing. Yeah. Like I don't even want to stop in Cabo. Like Cabo, it's like what? It's Cabo is just Touristy. like San Jose. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you know whatever. Yeah. But it was actually that was a great spot. Yeah, Flora Farms. Yeah. Flora right. Farms was amazing, and, and that was that was uh, that was Courtney's birthday. That oh, was my birthday. So that was kind yeah. of fun. Yeah, it was really nice, and Mark. We went to Guatemala and that was beautiful. And the sort of the geological nature of the land there is really, really interesting. And there was a live volcano and Mark bought me this beautiful jewelry from there. 
for so my sweet. birthday. Look at oh, you. Yeah. Oh, um, nice. I, I forgot. I forgot know, about some, that. Somewhat uh, are I'm known to wear the color black, and they had this beautiful black jade, and it was just stunning. And wow, um, it was this gorgeous town, and it was very sweet, and we had such a nice time with our friends. And Ecuador was beautiful. I mean, there was a moment where we're walking through the rainforest in Ecuador, and you oh, just yeah. pause to think like. I'm at the equator and I'm here in this totally yeah. remote part of the world and it's extraordinary. And we had this great lunch with all these really interesting people, mm. um, some of them from California, others from all over the world. They were all fascinated with Mark. They all wanted to know what Mark did. No, and I'd many of them knew Mark. My lunch that there's <laughs> alcohol involved. Well, maybe there was Let a little. Let me finish so we but can leave Courtney him in the that, rainforest. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney, that brings me the moments that I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't course. realize people were fascinated with me. That's interesting. i got to pay more attention. Yeah, no, no. I mean, just... Did I'm getting. I'm beginning to like the cruise more when it, now the people are fascinated with me. I mean, I'm gonna just. I'll also just land. On, I'll just end on like Peru was amazing, and there was this one day where we had a maybe a not so successful excursion, and I it ended up with me begging to get off of this boat. Oh, that's and I, no. I'm being like, yeah, I'm being like, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm being ferried back to the dock. Um, on this it's on tender. a little. It's a little like yeah. a, it's one of those tube boats, like those big tube type boats. You know what I mean, like rubber boats. Yeah, yeah like because yeah. I just do not. This is. I thought I was going to see penguins. By the way, this was the. You'll love this. <laughs> this was the because I I really just want to stay on the boat closer to my buffet, and um, that's and, true. And uh, Courtney it was going because she thought she was going to see penguins, but I, I, I so I penguins. so I said, you know what. I'm not going to go on this one. I just, I'm going to pass on today. So I stayed back there. I leisurely drank coffee. I watched you on the show. Mm -hmm. And meantime, she's out there begging to be taken back to shore from oh, this, uh, right? It was, it was like a hostage situation. Begging. So was begging. It like they there were not... no penguins? It was not as oh. advertised? Well, I mean, then it became very clear that it wasn't penguins. It was swimming with sea lions. And I was like, well, I don't oh. even have a bathing suit. And there's no tender that's being taken on this boat the tender there was, was no bathroom on the up. boat either it's yeah. kind of like they're there for hours so Would i you, oh. am yeah. now negotiating I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. a hostage <laughs> release from the boat i would have and i but like i get into this uber and the guy's great and he drives me to miraflores which is this gorgeous part of uh peru of lima that has uh, lima that has all these really nice restaurants and also has Incan ruins. And I'm wandering in this market where all of the uh, Indian, the Peruvian Indians come and they sell their goods. And I am sort of meandering through these long hallways of stalls of people and it's gorgeous, gorgeous textiles and silver jewelry. You know, the silver in Peru is 950, it's not 925. Oh, so it's so more it's, silver content? I, yeah, I it's no got more silver means, content, okay. it's just yeah. stunning. And I and it's it's and the artwork is a lot of like stuff you'd see at like Venice boardwalk here in L.A. Oh, you know, okay. with like alpacas with sunglasses, you know, <laughs> and like drinking yeah. um, a cocktail. Yeah. And I stumble upon this gorgeous piece of artwork and I stop and I said to the woman, that's beautiful. And she starts pulling out just these magnificent pieces. I mean, of fine art. And I, I'm my I absolutely my breath is taken away. And she turns to me and says, "It's him." And it's this gentleman named um, Jose Fernandez, and he studied in Mexico City and all over the world. And he's had exhibits up and down uh, Central and South America. And he's never been to the U.S. And his stuff is. I mean, extraordinary doesn't quite, in my mind, really bring to life the talent wow. um, and and sort of the extraordinary vision of of this man, of this artist. And so I was there for a while. And so she had a good piece. day that day. Yeah, and, uh, it was really special. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, we yeah. have gone on too long about this. Now it really does feel like yeah. we need music no, or right. visuals I or something. Talked, I should have had Courtney at the very beginning. You should have. This I is mean, gone now. I don't know how is, you're going to cut this. You're going to run this, all of this. It's crazy. This, I'm going to run the whole sorry. thing. This, no, this is beautiful. <laughs> I love it. 
No, I, I blame Courtney. She went on I'm too long sorry. about the artist, I thought. What I'll can just, you tell us about I'll the just, scene? I think Courtney's ruined the scene, Larry. Wanna... What can you tell us about the scene? <laughs> yeah. No, but like, I just want to mention, we were in line on the ship, and this man comes up to Mark, and he says... <laughs> Oh, hey, this is great. Use Mark he Thompson? says, "Hey, which one do you use, Mark Thompson?" No, what? no. <laughs> he says, "In this, in this gorgeous, Sp- yeah, Latino Spanish, voice. She's Latino, Mexican man. accent. Yeah. He's from Mexico. It's like <laughs> he's just, and he's just like got this gorgeous family, and he comes up to Mark and he says, what do you do on the ship?'" And I start giggling, and Mark kind of looks at him perplexed, and he says. <laughs> Because you talk to everybody. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> he thinks Mark works on the ship. Yeah. He said, but you, I mean, you must have some position here in, on the ship. What, what, what exactly do you do? <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm, just a, so I'm just a passenger, brother, yeah. just like you. He was amazing. He was a dentist from Mexico. Yeah. What can you tell us family? about the scene? Yeah. What can you tell us? Great. This guy thinks I'm it's the captain funny. of the ship, Larry. And I was like, it's charming. But not after nine years. It's not charming. <laughs> How it's dare lost you? Lost its charm. How dare you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's yeah. too good. So that was um, a lot of fun. Yeah, we had a lot of well, fun. Welcome I... home and happy belated birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. It was really, really cool. But we watched a lot. I did. I watched the show a lot and really got a kick out of it. And you did such a great job. You and did you continued such a to great do a good job. job. Yes. So, the whole team. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Kim, you will continue. Rothman's coming okay. through, and uh, you'll make good things happen. And then and, we have uh, your big interview that you have. Oh, that's right. We have yeah. a long interview, and I hope Lori is watching today. <laughs> so that every time we do a, it's kind of inside joke. Yeah. Whenever we have an interview that runs long. We always wait for Lori to go, oh, boring, please. <laughs> Couldn't we break this up in a few? This is unbelievable. I'm not saying I, and we like her so much. Yeah, we do. We love her. That it hurts. It, that's why my mockery comes from a place yeah. of hurt. It hurts your so, fragile uh, soul. It's all right. It does. It does. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, Kim. Welcome home. You're the best. Uh, good stuff. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, continuing to cover things. And we're back with totally live shows together on the first on the uh, first day after the new year which will one, be january one, 2nd 24 yeah yeah right on baby okay right. Bye. Yeah. the mark thompson show the mark thompson show i'm kim McAllister in for mark thompson today and with me i'm so excited to have my old friend john rothman coming on to the show so without any further ado let me welcome uh, john rothman to the mark thompson show good morning sir hi kim you know the third time is the charm that's what i say absolutely well thank you for being with me this morning and we have some big news out of michigan where they decided to go the opposite way of colorado and they rejected the insurrectionist ban from the 14th amendment and they decided to keep donald trump on the 2024 primary ballot in michigan and the reasoning was what well donald trump has not been convicted of insurrection he hasn't been charged with insurrection he hasn't been charged with sedition And in the end, I think the courts are doing the right thing. I know you and I had a discussion about this several weeks ago, and I don't know that you agreed with me, but I think in the end, (laughs) in the end, it is the people who have to make the decision. Unless, if Donald Trump were to be convicted of insurrection or sedition, and I would remind you that uh, uh, Special Counsel Smith has not suggested either one of those uh, as uh, conditions. What Donald Trump has been charged with is trying to subvert the American election. And uh, I think that is, in the end, what will bring him down, because the fake electors and the phone calls, including the one uh, recorded in Michigan last week or the released last week, and uh, the one in Georgia, I think that is his problem. The problem is he tried to prevent the counting of the electoral votes, and that is a subversion of American democracy. Many moons ago, I got to cross something off my bucket list. I went to Gettysburg. And I saw that battlefield. And then I was at the gift shop and I bought this uh, Constitution of the United States. And so I thought to myself, I'll look it up in my little handy dandy Constitution. And it says in here, you don't have to be convicted of anything to be 
but also it doesn't list the president of the United States as being someone who is subject to the law. But you if, could say, you well, take a look, it's, if you it's take a clearly look 14, that they meant they meant anybody holding higher office in the United States. Depends how you interpret it, Kim. Mm. In the end, Donald Trump will be brought down by his own hubris, uh, by the own actions, which we now have so much material on. It's unbelievable. It's true. I will read this week uh, Liz Cheney's book. I'm reading Adam Kinzinger's book. Uh, mm. All you have to do is read the uh, the January 6th report, which I have done, uh, there's no question he tried to subvert American democracy. And but I believe, and I said this before, it's obvious. I mean, yeah. and, no, and, it's, and it's, if you look at the constitution, it says, or provide aid or comfort to insurrectionists, he's already come out and said he would pardon them all. If that's not aiding them and comforting them, then I don't know what is. I agree with you. So let him be charged and convicted in a court. Well, the Michigan Court of Claims, who first got the case, said the state law doesn't give election officials any leeway to police the eligibility of presidential primary candidates. So in this case, they're thinking, well, then who? Who is the person that gets to decide if the candidate has participated or given aid or comfort to insurrectionists? The Supreme Court. Yeah. Just like in the case of Richard Nixon, the United States versus Richard Nixon which is the classic case. Now, I was asked the other day, did I believe that precedent would hold up? Well, I thought Roe v. Wade should be held up, and it wasn't. The Supreme Court, uh, to its uh, plus or minus, the Supreme Court has the final word. Yeah. And so that's what will happen. In the meantime, all I can tell you is, if, if I'm going to uh, rot in hell, uh, I would rather be there with you, Kim, uh, than <laughs> with uh, Donald Trump. All right, let's talk about, uh, since we're in, po in uh, domestic politics, Ramaswamy. Is it over yes. for Ramaswamy? Because he now is pulling ad money from key states in television buys. He said, he's tried to take a page from Trump, and he said uh, ad buys, television ad buys are for candidates with a low IQ, is what he said. And that he has, he's smarter than that. He said, we're doing it differently, spending money in a way that follows data, apparently a crazy idea in uh, in U.S. politics. Uh, he said that it has low ROI, television ads, and a, a trick that political consultants use to bamboozle candidates who suffer from a low IQ. Is this just a way of him not really wanting to say it's over, party over? It's over. Uh, he, he isn't registering in the polls. Uh, he will not be featured on CNN uh, or Fox or anywhere else in terms of debates. Uh, he's he's uh, uh, not going anywhere, and the quicker we get rid of him, the better. By the way, I find him to be particularly repellent as a candidate for president. So I'm he's, not regretting that at all. He's Let polling me in the number third spot, though. Yeah. Huh? He's polling in the number third spot. Number three. Yeah, that doesn't mean much. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't get him any delegates, and he's polling in the third spot in a caucus state where he's going to be crushed, mm -hmm. it's over. And I think DeSantis, who will come in second or third in Iowa, is also finished. Yeah. Uh, these candidates are marginal. The one you got to look at is Nikki Haley, because mm -hmm. everyone seems to be consolidating around Nikki Haley as the alternative to Trump. Uh, will it be enough? I just saw an ad this morning. I don't know if you've seen it. Chris Sununu, the governor of New Hampshire, has cut an ad for Nikki Haley in that state. It's a very effective ad. Wow. Very effective. But will it make a difference? We'll find out. Well, in New Hampshire, apparently they were only four points difference. So she was gaining on Trump. If you believe the polls. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have to tell you, I am very skeptical about polls. And I always remember uh, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. won the New Hampshire primary in 1964 on a write-in. On a write-in. He wasn't even on the ballot. <laughs> So New Hampshire is relatively unpredictable, uh, and we'll see. Remember that, uh, uh, well, look at all the people who won New Hampshire who have not gone on to be president. That's all I can say. So the, in the last election, there was some concern over ticket splitting. So that apparently is when there were 11 states holding gubernatorial elections, and the voters went for a different party for president than they did for governor. They that happens with congressional candidates, too. Yeah. Uh, there and are Democrats uh, uh, who won in certain states where there was ticket splitting. Uh, and you're seeing that reflected now in Congress. So all I can tell you is that uh, ticket splitting is a normal process. 
the well, days when you walked in and voted the straight party ticket are gone. not as typical as they once mm -hmm. were. I guess the same 11 governors are up for re-election at the same time that the president presidential race will be held. So there's now more concern that once again, that this will be different. And uh, politicians and analysts are trying to figure out how do you get people, how do you figure out and get people to vote for the same party? Look, people aren't going to vote the same party. They vote for individuals more and more and more. Party uh, discipline is not what it once was. Yeah. Uh, you can see that in the Republicans in the House of Representatives mm -hmm. uh, who uh, uh, wander off from their leadership. Uh, so it's not unusual to see ticket splitting. You're going to see more and more of it. There's a new poll out today, not sure which poll it was, pointing out that people have very little faith in political parties anyway. And it's mm -hmm. true. Political parties today are not the power uh, that they once were. And so there are more and more independents. But the simple fact is to be the nominee with a chance of winning either a presidency or a governor's race, you have to be a member of a political party. You have to have the backing of a political party. And as long as Trump has the backing of most Republicans, uh, he clearly will be the nominee. Something has to happen that, that disrupts that. Uh, and the same thing applies in the Democratic Party. Uh, it is the Democratic Party uh rank and file who choose the candidates. Here in California, we have a unique situation, and that is we no longer have party primaries. Now, number one and number two end up running against each other. So we've had several situations now where two Democrats have yeah. run against each other for the United States Senate. Uh, I don't like that. I would rather see a stronger uh, party system, a stronger Republican party, a stronger Democratic party, because then you have a real choice. Otherwise, uh, uh, I don't think it makes much sense. Well, since you brought that up, let's move to California politics because Republican Steve Garvey, former Dodger, right? Uh, he's risen in the, the polls for the Senate, U.S. Senate seat to replace the late Dianne Feinstein. And it's all Democrats and him. But now it looks like uh, Adam Schiff has is polling in the lead with Steve Garvey right behind him at number two. Um, and it's the the headline on Politico is that Democrats are rejoicing because of this. Wouldn't they want it to be an all Democratic ticket so there's no choice, no chance of a Republican getting in? No, I would rather see a Republican and a Democrat run against each other and the people have a clear choice. Uh, I don't I haven't seen that particular poll, but I prefer the idea of a Republican and a Democrat facing off against each other with the uh, differing positions on a whole variety of issues, and you have a real choice. If you have two Democrats running against each other, and they more or less, or two Republicans running against each other, and they more or less are similar on the issues, then it's a question of personality. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure, given the fact that candidates don't really campaign one-on-one -on -one anymore, it's mostly television ads anyway, mm -hmm. and, and some radio, but not nearly as much as there used to be. I would rather see a Democrat and a Republican run against each other. Adam Schiff's office put out a statement saying uh, that there's a real possibility that Garvey could finish in the top two and advance to the general election. He said, if that happens, Adam is the best candidate to beat him. Uh, and they say now he's got a political opposite in another type of, of you know, larger candidate. And that that's good to have the political opposite to debate. Exactly on the my issues. point. I agree completely. Stronger. Yeah. But well, let's assume it's not Adam Schiff for a moment. Let's assume for a minute that it's it's uh, Katie Porter. Katie Porter. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happens. You still have two people, different yeah. political parties, different ideologies, different approaches. Uh, and Steve Garvey will just have to make his pitch, if you'll pardon a very bad pun, to uh, California voters. And if he's able to hit a home run, yeah. he might find himself in the U.S. Senate. Let's talk about the escalating conflicts in the Middle East. I saw this article last night on CNN, and it reads, fears are rising of a widened Middle East war and U.S. troops are in the firing line. And it goes on to talk about these escalating attacks on U.S. troops, including the three U.S. service members that were fired on by a drone and injured in northern Iraq. It also talks about the uh, dangerous incidents with shipping in this area on the commercial shipping lines and the United States trying to protect the shipping companies. And so the fear is that all of this in the same, you know, in, in addition to the Israel Hamas conflict. And don't forget Lebanon, there's increasing act by Hezbollah uh, and over 300,000 Israelis living in the north of the country 
have been forced to flee their homes because of Hezbollah and its attacks. So you and have a multi-front war. And that's what the, they're saying is that this is there's new concerns that all of this could widen into a, they call it a regional conflagration uh, with grave political and economic consequences. Do you see this widening? Do you see us get I've talked about it from here? October 7th forward. I've had no hesitation about it. Some of you who listen to my podcast, around the political world with John Rothman, that was the commercial, know that I've talked about <laughs> Thinking the Unthinkable is the title of that particular podcast, and I talk about these possibilities. I also want to point out that on the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, as the Israelis call the area, uh, there is increased violence as well. So you have a multi-front war taking place, not to mention the fact that, according to the United Nations uh, inspectors, uh, Iran is now gearing up its... Uh, growth of its nuclear uh, program, uh, which may result in Iran having a nuclear weapon. Let me assure you it's all of this, and I don't want to leave on Erdogan of uh, Turkey, who just said that Netanyahu is worth, worse than Hitler. Oh, uh, wow. And uh, you have to listen to the speech. You can hear it. It's online. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just appalling. So all I can say to you is, yes, you can look forward. I hate to say it, that there will be a broader conflict uh, in, in uh, the year ahead. Does, do you see the United States being in the middle of this whole thing? Not in the middle, but the United States clearly is in, on Israel's side. We have common interests, which will uh, compel us to do that. The United States is not happy with Iran. It's not happy with Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's not happy with Hamas. Uh, the United States is now trying to reconstitute the Palestinian Authority, uh, which is now led by Mahmoud Abbas, but it's a futile moment because there is no way to reconstitute something which is so dysfunctional and corrupt. So the United States is really in a tough spot. And let me emphasize, it wouldn't matter who is president of the United States. This is not a matter of Democrat or Republican. It has to do with the problems in the Middle East, which clearly are very, very complex and difficult. But I do believe, and I hope I'm wrong, I want to say this very clearly, I hope I am wrong, uh, but I really see this growing. And by the way, you heard... Kanye West having to oh. apologize yesterday for his attacks on Jews, saying he's very sorry for it. He wrote just it in Hebrew. It. And I mean, he's just crazy. He, he's he's just gone crazy. nuts. But yeah. understand, there is also that dimension that Jews, as I've mentioned to you in the past, are feeling very threatened and insecure yeah. because of constant attacks. So the rise in Jew hatred, coupled with everything else, is not a very, not a very good sign. I was reading this article in Politico about, well, back to domestic politics, about uh, President Biden's picks for certain roles at the Pentagon and how they're stuck. And the uh, the lawmakers don't on the GOP don't really seem very motivated to vote for people like Derek Chollett, who yes, apparently exactly. this, he's this stuck goes there back and to... he's not getting out of committee even. No, and this goes back to Tuberville who finally surrendered this yeah. last week. Uh, but there's no doubt in an election year, a presidential election year, it's even yeah. harder to get things confirmed. Yeah. And clearly the Republicans believe that Joe Biden is on the way out. They're not going to give him anything at all. Yeah. Uh, and this is very similar to what uh, they did to Obama, and uh, very similar in, in a sense to what both political parties do when they see the potential to uh, take power. Uh, it is not good for the United States to see our military embroiled in any kind of domestic politics. And three cheers for the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, who refused at, in 2020 to allow the military to participate in any way in, in the political functioning of this country, and made very clear in his concluding statement that that is something we have to be alert to. So Democrats and Republicans are playing partisan politics uh, with uh, an institution which should be above politics. I know you don't. You said you don't believe in polls, but one came out yesterday uh, that Donald Trump quoted and posted this really weird message. Uh, he, the The message is about revenge and dictatorship as yeah. priorities. Yesterday, he's saying he's that's what um, that he shared the poll result and that these are his priorities, revenge and dictatorship. Yeah, and he, he reposted that. Let me tell you, I was at a, a dinner party over the holiday 
and uh, sat next to a man who is not a Trump supporter, but supports Trump's economic policies and would be inclined to vote for him for those reasons. And I pointed out all the things that Trump has said, uh, the question of uh, uh, poisoning the blood of America, and now the question of, of uh, roasting in hell or rotting in hell. Mm -hmm. oh, and the, the Christmas I message. said, doesn't that mean anything? <laughs> and the response was, it's just campaign rhetoric. Well, no. let me tell you something, Kim. I, I believe that campaign rhetoric matters. Yeah. And I believe that if you use uh, excessive language, uh, you use uh, rhetorical flourishes, they mean something. If somebody says to you they're coming to kill you, you should believe them. Right. Donald Trump is coming to kill democracy, and he's yeah. making it very clear. And the American people are going to have to make a choice. When Joe Biden says the Constitution is at, at, is at stake, he's mm -hmm. absolutely right. So let me explain it better. It was a word cloud. And so a thousand people were asked which words resonated with them, uh, depending on which candidate. And for President Biden, they said economy and peace. Uh, but for Trump, the top results were revenge, power, and dictatorship. And he embraced that and reposted it. And it's one of those things where when someone tells you who they are, believe them, right? He's showing us time and time again. And so I just, I, it's so hard to understand why people wouldn't see the truth and the writing on the wall. I agree with you. Uh, you and I are in complete accord. I don't have an answer, except that I can guarantee you that if, until November, we are going to have a repetitive conversation about this because yeah. the Trump voters are clearly, well, I, they're a member of a cult. You know, anything Trump says is, is good. Uh, I'm, I'm more concerned about American democracy. Let me, let me just be clear. If Joe Biden were making the kind of statements that Donald Trump is making, I'd be just as upset. Absolutely. I would be just as angry. I'd be just as disturbed. Yeah. When Joe Biden says we're in a battle for the future of this country, he's right. And they're, in my judgment, and again, as a former radio talk show host and as somebody who does a podcast and who is rather outspoken in his opinions, you don't have to agree with me all the time. I, I understand that. Although I don't understand why you don't agree with me. <laughs> but the, the simple fact is those are the choices. And it is going to be repetitive because we are going to have to re-emphasize and reach out to more people so that they understand it. One can only hope that by his own words, Donald Trump will be judged. Yeah. John Rothman, it's a perfect place to end it. Thank you so much for coming on The Mark Thompson Show. Kim, it's always a pleasure. And may I say, I won't see you till next year. That's right. Happy and New so, Year. Uh, yes, but I'm looking forward to, to spending another year with you. And, Sounds good. Uh, and Mark will be back next week, right? He'll be back next week. Remember on the old KGO days, every New Year's Eve, we'd spend together. We did. Yeah. And may I say, I wish we were doing it again. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Have a great day. Happy, happy New Year. Healthy. Bye. Year. You Bye. too. Feel it in your soul. The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, it's pretty special. Uh, to have a guest in who has the kind of perspective on so many things related to music that this guy does. He's known probably as the Doors manager because I think, and I can even ask him about that in just a second, that's sort of the, the thing that punches through the noise, you know. But he's been involved with so many great acts through time, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, America, uh, Alice in Chains. Uh, he's a so much fun, and I uh, consider him a, a good friend, especially for being here. <laughs> Bill Seddon's everybody. Come on. Man, the real reason he invited me over is I'm his next door neighbor. It is true. You're my next door neighbor. I, I hit the jackpot on neighbors, that's for sure. Um, that's right. I changed his tire for him. Last this, week. Is, this is particularly true that you have skills that I will never possess. The skills to. I mean, you do a lot of, you know, you could build a house. You've got that kind of thing. And uh, you know, watching Chase build my fence, I realize there's so much. He, he's a carpenter, he cuts every board to fit. I realize, oh, there's a lot of skills that I don't have. I but see. I'm willing to take on anything. It's not, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it's nice that you're focusing on the things that you, that you, you don't have. It's good. I think in life, it's really good too. You know, just to, it's good for the mood. Um, so let me get uh, into co some questions that I have. The Doors really is, it's a weird uh, enduring calling card for you, isn't it? Well, it is because it's enduring. Yeah. You know, somewhere around 20 years ago, I went, 
wow, my career has been so weird. Every different, I had John Clemmer, a tenor saxophone player, first real breakthrough in the smooth jazz kind of thing. Sure. He was pure jazz, not smooth jazz, but it was ballad, so it was beautiful. And Alice in Chains and Robert Palmer and just every musical type. Uh, Daz band? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, Daz band. Don't, t- don't tell me. Don't tell me. Daz band was, that wasn't bop, Drop a Bomb on Me? Was No, that? that was Gap Band. Gap Band. What was Daz band? Daz band was uh, Let It Whip. Oh, Let, Let It, it Whip. Baby. Yeah, that was great. And Champagne. Uh, so I've had a huge variety of artists that I've worked with. But the, the one thing I figured that they had in common is that most of them were uh, important culturally. And I thought, well, that's really wonderful that, that happened to me. I don't take credit for doing it. I just felt that it was great that I, uh, the decisions that I made as I moved along, I got involved with artists that were really important artists. When you say you work with different artists, what is the work of a manager who, what, like, what do you do with these well, guys? Well, the, the pat answer is the manager is the CEO of the corporation for the artist. So everybody reports to the manager and the manager reports to the artist. So the publicist, the record company, the agent, the road manager, accountant, whatever, anybody who is employed providing services for the artist ultimately goes through the manager. Sometimes some relationships, you know, the business manager was there long before me and they deal direct and I don't have anything to do with their financial services. But mostly if there's something that needs to be done, it falls to the manager. These days, the manager is now the record company because that disappeared. I see. You know, uh, a lot of managers are running small labels, and that's a hundred times more work. Not usually for much more money. And it's interesting. Anyway, so it's not lucrative. You're saying to be to well, it can be if you re- really run it as a label, but a label requires consistent product flow, and mm. you know you need a staff to make a label work and you can't afford a staff if you're just doing one artist record every two years. How did you come on the doors? How did that, was that your first? That was my first job in the music business and it was a complete and total accident. My best friend went away to college and he made friends with a guy there named Ronnie and Ronnie was a the brother of a guy named Robbie and Robbie was Robbie Krieger. And Rich kept asking me to go to these local club gigs that the band was doing, come help with the equipment, which did not interest me. And then one day he called and said, hey, you know, we're going to San Francisco tomorrow and we got a spot in the bus, you know, in the VW van. That's a three-seater. And we got a third (laughs) seat if you want to come along, have a trip to San Francisco. We're staying at the Jack Tar Hotel. And I was 18. And, uh... I said, no, I got a class tomorrow. I can't go. And I hung up and I heard my mother say, Bill, did you just turn down a free trip to San Francisco to go to class tomorrow? And I said, right, Ma, thanks. And I called Rich back and said, I'll go with you. So your mother is the reason that you were. Really? Yeah. Oddly. Yeah. And so you go on that trip and then what happens? Well, I kind of attribute the moment to we were unloading the VW van up the back stairs of the Avalon ballroom, and there were at least 50 stairs, just straight up six feet wide from the alley up to the stage area. And uh, I'd never met the band, didn't really know their music. And um, so I was going up the stairs, and the band you know, halfway through unloading the van, the band shows at the top of the stairs and they go, who are you? I said, oh, I'm Rich's best friend. He he invited me to come up this weekend and help out, so I'm helping out. And Robbie looked at me and says, do you have a summer job? I said, "Uh, no, why? He said, do you want a summer job? I said, yeah, I got to get one soon. It's May. (laughs) And he said, why don't you be our equipment guy? And I went, what? And I literally started looking left and right. I didn't know what to do. I looked behind me and I saw Rich and Ronnie coming up the stairs on either end of one amplifier. I had an amplifier in each hand. I see. So they- Robbie just did the math. That's four times more efficient. (laughs) (laughs) So 
So you and then I began said, your. I don't even know how to plug anything in. They said, "Don't worry about that. Just get it up on the stage. We'll plug it in." I said, "Okay," and I had a summer job. And then it was time to go back to college, and they said, "Oh, you can't go back to college. We need you." And I said, "I no, I'm not going to Vietnam. I'm going back to college." And uh, they said, "Okay, well, we'll just work weekends, but you got to work for us through the fall." And I, Gee, I hadn't really planned on doing it that way, but let me try. And by the end of that semester, I had failed four classes, and I had uh, three units of criminology and three units of something else, and I got a D and a B minus. And what? I said, well, this is not going to work out. And then we promoted our fr- Rich and I and his neighbor across the street who had the money for the deposit promoted our first show as promoters at our college, Cal State Long Beach. And uh, we put them into the gym. Uh, and in order to get into the gym, we had to affiliate with a student society. And so Rich, being in poli sci, political science, right. decided that we should affiliate with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Sure, they were very, big at that time, actually. Very strong advoca- advocate organization who later became the weathermen right right and uh, who also were very strong advocates yeah that was a big the big anti-war movement of vietnam at the time yeah so we did the show december 1st we sold out two shows we held the record for six months of the hottest part of the doors career paying them more than anybody else wow and uh and then in mid-december end of december they said look we just fired our managers we want you to be the manager and I, you know, uh, I have no idea what a manager does. <laughs> well, you just booked him into the most successful game. <laughs> and they said, don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll just have a meeting every Friday and decide. Wow. And I said, okay. And so I became the appointed manager and learned to trade uh, in real time. And by the way, in order to do that, I said, I have one requirement. I am not going to Vietnam. So if it comes to that, I'm going back to Canada, being a Canadian born and still a Canadian citizen. Ah, oh, okay. And they said, we'll pay whatever it costs to get out of the draft. I said, okay. And I went to, I think her name was Beth, the woman that we dealt with at Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and said, I really have to figure out how to beat the draft. Do you know anyone who can help? And she said, yes. She gave me a name and a phone number, and Rich and I went to meet him, and he uh, you know, is asking a few questions. And I said, you know, look, all I want to know is how many cases have you handled? And he said, 403. And I said, how many of those went in the service? He said, three. I said, okay, where do I sign? <laughs> you know, that's all I needed to know. Yeah. You just wanted a track record. And he was brilliant at his job. He knew exactly how to make the system work for him and me. And so because I was a Canadian, I still had to serve and I was certainly willing to serve, but not to kill people. And they didn't give you an option to not kill people. Yeah, no, that's, that's so just I tried, sort of part of the deal. Uh, you know, I went to the draft board and asked about getting uh, into, you know, working in a hospital or something. And they just said, you have to become a, you have to prove that you are a pacifist. Yeah. Conscientious objector. Is that what they called them or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. But. But really a pacifist, which means if somebody punches you, you don't hit back. Right. I was not a pacifist. Right. Close, but not quite that. Yeah. So I knew I'd probably fail that test. And uh, so you went to, so this guy who becomes the, essentially the, uh, I don't want to, I'll use the word fixer almost to try to make sure that he was, he was a lawyer who knew the right uh, shrink to go do the interpretation. I see. And the right. Uh, people to administer the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory. And the one thing he said that made all the difference in the world, he says, do you have anyone outside of a major city? And it was me and Rich. He said, that you can absolutely trust a hundred percent to take anything mailed to you and put it in a new envelope, put a new stamp on it and mail it directly to you. And I went, Rich went, I have an aunt in Great Falls. So we went, Bill knew, the lawyer, that what you do is you sign for to take your physical 
somewhere else. You can say you're living somewhere else, but you can't change your draft board. So I signed for my physical in Montana and ultimately managed to fail my physical in Butte, Montana, one of the greatest days of my life. Wow. <laughs> you f- failing a physical is pretty wild. Um, How do they do that? Uh, well, I was a drug-dependent bisexual. I see. According to the interpretation. Sure, that's the key. And uh, in Montana, they weren't interested. It's all in the, the guy interpretation. at the end of the line said, reject, <laughs> became one of my favorite words. <laughs> all right, so... Now you're not going to Vietnam. You're with the Doors. You're their manager, but you don't really know what you're doing. Right. And but uh, I figured it out fairly quickly. I yeah. just, you know, there it's an they, endless learning process. And again, they're not yet the Doors in a big, big way, the way they were going to be. Well, I would point out that I started May 17th, and on July 3rd, like my fire hit number one. So is that because you were able to... Uh... Absolutely. had nothing to do with it. It just <laughs> happened. And... I made sure they got to the gig on time and the stage got set up and sure. And somebody was watching Jim. So you knew, right? I mean, obviously when light my fire hits and but you knew just as a fan of music and as a, having been around the band, you got that there was something special there, right? The first show I didn't, you know, I didn't know, didn't know the music hadn't listened to an album, but when Jim went into horse latitudes at the Avalon, my head exploded. It was like the only time in my life I ever saw a whole movie to words. It, it was as if I had written the video for it in my head. It was just visual. And I went, nobody else does that. And that was the moment that I went, oh, this these guys are really different. And in a live performance, and I suppose even, uh, you know, it, it helped just the general profile of the band, Jim Morrison was insanely charismatic and uh, such a handsome, I mean, gorgeous guy too, right? Most people thought so. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't have those inclinations. No, but I'm saying you could tell as someone who was objectively uh, 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 sort of figuring out the commercial appeal of this band, there was that too. Immense charisma on the part of Morrison, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody wanted to talk to him. And our publicist at Electra, you know, the education you get every day, we we were getting bombarded with solicitations for interviewing Jim. And he said, I turned most of them down. I said, why? He said, I want the cover. By the third time they ask, I can get the cover. He was a sharp guy also, yeah. huh? Yeah. He understood. <laughs> yeah. And he was also, it seemed, and I mean, was this just me reading into it, the, the poetry of it all and sort of who he was, he seemed kind of deep or seemed like a real artist that was more than just one dimensional rock star. He was not interested in being a rock star. Yeah. He was enjoying the game for a while about, oh, look what I can do. Oh, this is amazing. But he was completely, I mean, he was probably the brightest guy I ever knew. Um, erudite, knowledgeable, and just, I made him stop talking to me a couple times because my head couldn't keep up. He was just, he was as deep as they come and completely playful and uh, hysterical at times too. So as Oliver Stone said to me when I went and read the script for the movie, and I said, Oliver, why do you just show such a one-dimensional person and the ugly side of him? Right. There's so much more to him. And he said, well, Bill... I interviewed 50 people about this uh, movie and they all knew a different gym and I had to choose one. Oh, that's interesting. And I kind of went, well, why did you choose the asshole? Yeah. You know, cause that's what I thought the, the guy was in the movie. The character they portrayed was someone who, yes, that was part of Jim's persona that he would, uh, he didn't have a lot of empathy for what you were suffering. He just wanted to make you react in a very real way. So he provoked people as a matter of sport. And so he, um, the Oliver Stone movie you helped me was Val Kilmer. Did he play? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're saying that, that while it's a fair depiction of that part of the guy, it really neglects a whole bunch of other much yeah. more favorable I mean, parts you know, of I'm, the guy. I went to dinner with Jim near the Troubadour one night and a guy comes by the table and he's got a, a box 
of silverware, basically. In fact, ironically, I happen to be wearing a ring right now that wow. is of that design. Is that? Oh, okay. It's made from the end of a spoon right. curled up. And uh, Jim looked at him and says, this is how you make your living? He says, yeah. And Jim bought the whole box, like 40 rings, and oh. gave them away. He was, the, you know, he sure. just didn't have any kind of consciousness towards being a normal person. He yeah. just, somebody needed help, he did. He was a super young guy. You know, I, I, you know, I think back at his, because his legacy is such a powerful one and it's so enduring, as we said. But he was a young guy, he died at 27, wasn't it, or something yeah. like that? I mean, so that means that a lot of these things you're talking about, this immense success, all happened, you know, what, when he was 25 or 20? 23. God. It just exploded. It's pretty hard. And, and this, I would even suggest you might have a perspective on because some of your other clients, I would think it's hard to maintain, you know, like any kind of sort of, you know, uh, magnetic north, you know, when you're hitting it so big, so young. Uh, I read a story in this morning's paper about Louis Capaldi, mm -hmm. somebody that I used to know. Isn't that? No, that was the, the Australian guy. Um, yeah, I used to. Somebody you used to love. Yeah. Um, now I'm just somebody that, that I used to know. Yeah, I think used that's to know. a wrong yeah, yeah. record. But Capaldi had a number one record in the whole world three or four years ago. Someone you loved, I think it was. Yeah. And it was a magical record, fantastic mm -hmm. record. And, the you know, they did a documentary on the mental health impact of what that did to him. And he's still suffering. And you realize, right, right, you know, you're you're a poet. You kind of have no ambition. You're not trying to get rich. You're just trying to get better at something. And then all of a sudden, they back up the dump truck and shower you with money and everything that you could ever want. You want drugs, women, anything. Right. And, uh, you know, there just were no limits. So you have to establish them for yourself. And Jim is not particularly good at that side of it. Well, plus, I think that at that time, wasn't it, it was just a sex, drugs, and rock and roll culture at that time. It was exploding as such, wasn't it? Or well, or was that just my sense? Yes, of it? but it was psychedelic wasn't... culture, for example. LSD yeah. was being, you know what I mean? All yeah. these. You know. It was a giant cultural change, right? But you know the uh, the sex and drugs and rock and roll thing that Motley Crue personified, we didn't, right? N you know, it, it just. It was available, right. but do you want to participate? So yeah, Jim slept with a number of different women, but he was always in love with Pamela. That you know that was his north, as it mm -hmm. were. Yeah, she was a handful herself, but he, uh, it was very hard to find things to hold on to that you really want to do. There are some artists that figure out, I'm just saying no, and I'll do what I want when I want. To hell with what it means in the career and we had a partner in the band named ray manzarek who was quite machiavellian and was always pushing for more mm. that was kind of his job i was going to ask about the rest of the band during this time um was were they understanding and uh coalescing around jim were they in other words uh, or was it a was there much infighting or was it was the i'm just curious about the consistent the texture of the band itself it changed quite a bit over a couple of few years. You know, it started out with everybody just hanging on and kind of enjoying the ride, a little intimidated by it. But uh, little by little, it got to, oh, God, what are we going to do about Jim? Because mm. he would just show up too drunk to work. He uh, was becoming a real, you, you know, John was, I, I called him a, a, a mama's boy, but he was more like grandma's boy. He had very traditional values. Jim what, Morrison. John Densmore. Oh, okay. And Jim challenged all of those I values. Okay, and kept, okay. You know, he wanted to go out and do the best possible show they could. Jim wanted to go out and freak people out. Sure. You know, so they had very differing ambitions that conflicted. And so that gradually resulted in it becoming Jim Morrison and the Doors internally as well as to the general public. Although we never authorized the use of that phrase, uh, it's kind of what happened. Wow. Uh, 
I wanted to ask you about the alcohol thing real quick. Then I'm going to move on from the doors, but it's just so interesting to to hear this. Um, and I wanted to ask you about whether or not the alcohol thing, indulgence on the part of Jim Morrison, was it your take? I mean, you can never know, but was it your take that it was, he was like, you always hear, you know, I'm self-medicating, that he was killing, so he was dulling some pain, or he was, or was he just in the decadence of it, or he was just in the celebration of it, or where, where did it come from, do you think? I think the, the last two are closer. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he was acknowledging any pain or really suffering in that way, but he was Irish. He loved to drink. Yeah. Excuse me for being nationalist, right? but the Irish are worldwide renowned for their ability to drink. And uh, Jim, although there was every drug around, and uh, he once bought an ounce of cocaine and went to the desert with his film crew and shot part of Highway, and the ounce was gone in a week. You know, what? Yeah. You know, it took me two weeks to get rid of a gram. It was, but that's all he ever did. I never knew him to do coke other than that. He'd try it and see how far he could go. So how, uh, the alcohol yeah. to yeah. me was more about uh, Jim just pushing the envelope, just seeing how far could he get. And the first week I went to, you know, when I was first working with them, the first weekend we played the Avalon and then we played um, the, uh, it'll come to me in a second, uh, in Santa Monica on the pier. Mm -hmm. And um, Jim managed to get, the, the, uh, they wanted me to come to New York, but they couldn't afford an airplane ticket. So I hitchhiked to New York and then I got to New York. I didn't have a hotel, so I stayed at the Y and I, <laughs> wow. and I learned about gay culture there. And, uh, <laughs> that's for another conversation. Yeah. But, uh, but, so, uh, we did this, we were playing at the scene, a club at the same time, Monterey, uh, pop festival was going on and the guys would not play a pop festival because they did not want to be thrown into the mixer. They wanted people who were interested in what they do to come see them. Mm. That was kind of their mental attitude. And so we did, uh, the scene and the first weekend, we had a gig on Long Island on Saturday night for real money, $5,000. Yeah. And it was a place called the Action House. And we got there in the afternoon, and I'm trying to figure out how to get a stage set up. And Jib's over at the bar hanging out. And by the time the show went on, Jim was so drunk that he could barely stand or move. And I was. I was panicked because I was 18. I had no education, no idea what to do with anything like this. And so, and I knew it was my fault. No matter what, it was my well, fault. Well, if he doesn't show up or can't perform, then it is your fault. Yeah, yeah. except I'm just the equipment guy. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, at that point, you weren't the manager. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm panicked, and uh, Jim just couldn't get through the second or third song. Densmore and Krieger walked off stage in the middle of it. And I just, I ran over to the bar and I grabbed the bartender and said, you serve him? He said, uh, yeah. I said, how much did he drink? He says, I don't know. Let me check the tab. And he gets the tab and brings it over and he starts counting. Jim did 26 shots of VO wow. in three hours. That's just... I didn't know you could live through that. Yeah, yeah. So he pushed the envelope at anything that he did. When... He became embroiled in all the um, uh, porn, what they considered like pornographic exposing yourself stuff in Miami. I think it the was. weenie waiver incident. Yeah, exactly. You were that you were managing the the band at that time. Correct. What was the um, what was happening? Like what, what what was your take on it? And what did you did you see things spiraling, or did you see it as manageable? Or where it was also creating tremendous attention for the band. I'm wondering if there is any of this stuff good. Oh, well, we didn't think so. I think it destroyed Jim ultimately. It destroyed his desire to be in the business, to be an entertainer. Uh, but the, the uh, incident did no the well, reaction I, to the oh, the reaction to the incident. I'm sorry, okay, because there was no uh, proof that he would exposed himself. Right, but he thought he might have. He was kind of going, "Is this what you're here for?" I see. He was challenging his audience. He had seen the Living Theater, a traveling European. Uh, 26 people 
it was an, I saw them too with him one night. He went all four nights, and that <laughs> inspired him to be very confrontational. I see. Uh, you know, they would walk through the audience, 15 of them, and walk up and scream in your face, I am not allowed to smoke marijuana, and that kind of stuff. And so uh, he started doing that with the audience. And, you know, after the show, I'm hanging out with a couple of the cops, and I had to pay a cop because Jim took his hat and threw it in the audience. So I had to give him 70 bucks to replace his hat. Oh my God. <laughs> and one of the cops said, you know, it only hurts himself, doesn't doesn't matter to anybody else, but the show sucked, and he was a mess. And I went, yeah. And the, the thing was, I knew about it coming on because when we left L.A. International to get to Miami that day, playing that night, um, Jim was coming to the airport by himself with Pamela, not with the band. Gotcha. So we're all at the airport waiting for Jim, he shows up at 8.35, 8.40, and he and Pamela have a fight in the limo, and she takes off. And so I am I just told the guys, get on the plane, I'll catch up somehow. And I did, but I had to stop in New Orleans. And I noticed halfway from New Orleans, because we'd gone upstairs to the bar at the airport, uh, I looked over and I could see Jim's facial muscles slacken. And I went, uh-oh, he drank way too much. That's all I knew. No one had any idea what was going to happen. The gig was complete chaos. Mm -hmm. Some guy showed up that had some connection to them and he was carrying a lamb with him. And it was just a freak show. And I was going through the biggest nightmare of my career to date because the promoter um, had made an offer of $25,000 flat, no percentage. We'd never done a flat before, but the agent said, you know, it's, it's basically 60% of the gross already, so let's just take it. I said, okay. Well, of course, the gross doubled, mm -hmm. and we were stuck with a flat. I'd filed a thing with the AF of M, and, so, and the, uh, the promoter, my, I had hired these guys from Philadelphia who'd done a gig a couple weeks before for us in Philadelphia, and they were fantastic. Black guys, one guy was a former lieutenant in the police force and everybody else was the people he arrested and they all worked for him. So that was a Wow, team. what an interesting configuration. Yeah, yeah. he just, so I, we had like four guys come down and uh, the, the head guy comes up to me when I'm, you know, I, I'm going through nightmares trying to get paid and I wouldn't put the band on until I got paid. And blah, blah, blah. and <laughs> Sullivan comes over to me and he says, uh, Hey, Bill, you ever heard of the Palmero brothers? And I said, yeah, I think so. Why? He says, well, they're in town and they're friends of mine. Do you want anything to happen here? And I looked at him and I almost shit my pants because I thought he had just offered to kill that guy for me. <laughs> wow. And I went, uh, no, no, I think we'll leave that out of the picture for right now. So it was a, you know, it was tumultuous in every possible way. Right. But we left and nobody thought a second thought about it. And uh, the Monday following, a uh, ambitious reporter had called every judge and every police officer and said, do you know what's happening in your community? And, you know, did the, uh, the red baiting thing and... Uh, they all decided, oh, we're going to do something about this. So they issued an arrest warrant for Jim. And I sent my attorney to Miami to deal with it. And by the way, we were scheduled to go to Jamaica on that Sunday on vacation. We'd rented houses with cooks, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, Jim had fought with Pam. and he just So, so he wasn't going without Pam. But I, he might have. I don't remember that clearly. But um, so this was their vacation week. And this whole newspaper thing blows up in the Miami Herald. And my lawyer goes down. And uh, he said, I'll call you when I get there. Now, I understand there was no form of communication but telephone. And he called me. I said, so what's going on down there, Max? He says, Bill, this is the biggest thing to hit Miami since Columbus landed. Wow. <laughs> wow. I went, uh-oh. 
Yeah, That's not a in a good way. Yeah. yeah, not in a good way. So needless to say, it turned into a, a complete nightmare for a couple of years for Jim because we couldn't, most of our gigs that we'd booked got canceled because the hall managers did not want that happening in their hall. The communities did not want this happening. It was due to obscenity or whatever. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. he was accused of obscenity mm -hmm. and profanity. Well, not to my child. Right. You know, so you just had this whole it, culture clash going on, which was really the hippies and the establishment. No, that's so right on. As you, as you say it, I'm thinking, gosh, it, it really does reflect the culture that there was yeah. this puritanism trying to hold off what was clearly just a, a new generation of, you know, it's tough to be a rebel as a rock and roller if you, you know, uh, you know, if you can't have at least a little bit of an edge, you know, and yeah. I guess he was just, I mean, he cranked the edge way up, but... um were you there for the Sullivan show? Yeah, of course. And what was, can you remind us all what the Sullivan show was? It was his, was. Uh, At that point in time, Ed Sullivan was pretty much the only national television show that you could get music on. And the only one that mattered to be sure. And uh, uh, the Beatles had done it and exploded. So it was the big career opportunity. And, uh, and where was the where were the doors in their career at that time when they were to go on the Sullivan Show or when there was talk of going on the Sullivan Show? Had Light My Fire come out, for example? Yeah. Okay. So they were they were already. It, it was it, it was already blowing up, and this was kind of the coup de gras. Sure, of course. Know? Okay. Anyway. And the funny thing is, the only thing I can really remember is that I'm standing there with Jim on stage. They just done a run through a sound check, and Ed walks over <laughs> and says to Jim. He says, uh, Mr. Morrison? And Jim says, yes, Mr. Sullivan. And he says, you know, I, I, th I think it would be better if you weren't so somber. If you were just reflect more of a good time. And Jim just looked at him and laughed. Not out loud, didn't embarrass him. He was not, he was a gentleman, but he just couldn't believe that's what he was being asked to do. So he was uh, intense and uh, and there was that lyric, right? That they there was, a, to... yeah. They uh, they decided that "Girl, We Couldn't Get Much Higher" was a drug reference, and therefore we couldn't do it. And so Jim agreed not to do it, and then of course did it. Oh, I forgot. Right. And uh, they were pissed off. Vinnie Kaluta, who was the producer, director, talent guy, you know, was screaming at the managers who were there for that at that time. So God, Sal and Ash were still the managers, so that was the first six months. Uh huh. You know, and I mean, that's a that's a storied. Uh, well, it's in the movie. I think the right. You'll never do. You'll never do Ed Sullivan again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, and man. he said that, and we all just kind of went, "Okay, well, we did it." Yeah, hey man, we did Ed Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> just great. So, uh, where were you? How did you find out about the passing of Jim Morrison? I was asleep at my new house in Manhattan Beach with my new wife, um, and uh, the phone rang at four o'clock in the morning. And it was Clive Selwood, who was the head of our English label. And he, uh, he called. My wife sat bolt upright and said, Jim's dead. I went, what? <laughs> and I said, uh, hi, Clive? He said, yeah. I said, why are you calling me at four in the morning? He says, I've had three different journalists from France call me for a statement about Jim Morrison's death. Do you know anything? And I said, uh, absolutely not. I'll call you as soon as I can find out. So I started calling the apartment, no answer. And I finally got Pamela to answer. I mean, I called every 20 minutes all day. And it's finally somewhere around noon, she answered. And the doors were pretty much estranged from each other at that point. Um, the Light My Fire uh, license which Robbie wrote, but uh, he, while Jim had disappeared on us for a week, we had no idea where he was. We got, uh, Buick wanted to use Light My Fire in a commercial, and uh, we wanted, you know, everything in the band was all four, and right. this was the first time we'd been confronted with making a decision without Jim. And uh, Robbie just finally said, well, I wrote the song. I think it's okay. So we said yes, and Jim came back from wherever he disappeared to and was just heartbroken.
that they would even think of doing that because that back was then, the counterculture. Right. Back then it was viewed as selling out. You didn't out. do, yeah, that yeah. was totally selling out. You didn't promote products. Yeah. Holy crap. That was sure. Just completely That's like giving into the corporate, the corporatocracy. Yeah, corporate exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, there was an estrangement you're saying within the Yeah, that, that happened. And then uh, they finished LA Woman and he decided that he was maybe done with rock and roll. He wanted to write. He was he was interested. He had a screenplay in development. He was going to Paris. And I don't know how the other guys felt, but I went, great. That's a really good thing for you. And so he moved to Paris, and I talked to him every couple of weeks and kept him apprised of what was going on with how incredibly well the L.A. Woman album was being received. And it was being well received. Wasn't it, it was being very well received. We had an instant top 10 single. With Lover Madly on it. Yeah, sure. Very interesting moment in the creation of that record. They'd finished the record. It was recorded in my office. Downstairs was their rehearsal room, and upstairs on the other side of my desk was the console that Bruce Botnick had rented. And so I'd leave the office for the day. They'd come in and make records. That's how LA Woman was made. Wow. And uh, so I got 24 hour use out of my studio. <laughs> Were they prolific in the sense that... Uh... Jim was always writing poetry, right. and then they'd spend a couple of weeks hammering melody into it. Mm. But it almost always came from Jim's poetry. The ironic thing is, Robbie wrote Lover Madly, Light My Fire, and one of the other big records. Robbie wrote the hits. Jim right. wrote the body of work. Sure. So they were very productive, uh, but not they didn't do a record every six months. So anyway, they did, did the L.A. Woman album, and I had talked to Jim, and he seemed in really good spirits, and uh, and then I got that call from Clive, and so when I finally got Pamela on the phone, I said, uh, Pamela, this is, comes from pretty reliable sources. I want to help you. I am there for you and for Jim. And she said, well, no, it's okay. And, and I said, no, Pamela, you don't understand. If Jim died, I am coming to help you. Do whatever you want. So she said, okay, and I went straight to the airport and got in a plane and flew to Paris. And I got to the apartment at 6 a.m. the next day, and I didn't want to go pounding on the door at 6 a.m., so I went to a little Starbucks, kidding, but you know the a French cafe. idea of a morning yeah. coffee place, right. right, where they all drank a half an ounce of espresso yeah, and, and then had a shot of brandy to go to work. And... Um, so I, I went to the apartment, and uh, the casket was in the apartment, bolted closed. And, I, you know, I loved Jim. He was my friend and someone I admired beyond possibility. I had no interest in seeing him dead, and it just never occurred to me that that was my job. So that allowed the promotion of the myth that Jim's not dead. I see. You know, that I didn't make that move. The... The casket was there in the apartment. In the apartment, yeah, they. And it was, it was lo it was bolted shut. You're saying, yeah, okay. It was you know beautiful uh, light oak, right? Uh, beautifully finished, and it had probably ten, you know, big headed bolts that were in the top, and it just never occurred to me to take the bolts off and make sure Jim was in there. Sure, that D was did. They did that in 24 hours' time and just the time between the death and... Well, no. I mean, I understand. I'm in L.A. It's a 12-hour flight. It's, okay. So uh, Day and a half, Jim maybe. died, I think, Saturday night, and I got there Tuesday morning. I see. Okay, so there was time for... Yeah. Gosh, it's just a... It is so eerie. And then his grave, he was buried there, right in France. Yeah. He, it, Pam said that Jim had told her they'd been to visit Père Lachaise because... Many of the great figures in French culture were buried there. You know, Victor Hugo, um, Edith Piaf. Sure. And, you know, just the greatest creatives of French history were in Père Lachaise. And Jim told her, I want to be buried in Père Lachaise. He wasn't thinking of dying. He just knew that if he was going to be buried, that would be where he'd want to go. So we figured out how to make that happen. And they had a really wonderful woman there who was the daughter of the Canadian consul who was their assistant. And uh, she was very resourceful and, of course, fluent in French and all that. So 
So they were able to make that process happen. It might have been impossible for anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what the the intent was to keep it secret. They told the when he died, they told the uh, the French that he was an American poet and he was there as you know to write poetry, and that they gave no hint of who he was culturally. So the the officials didn't realize that they had this obligation to share information. So we were able to keep it secret until we buried him. Got him buried, and then I went to the airport and flew home and uh, went straight to my publicist's office that night and met with Robert Hilburn and Frank from uh, the Herald Examiner, and they both wrote uh, statements for me and explained why it came out that we just didn't want, you know, Pamela was very clear. I don't want the rock and roll circus around this. Right. Uh, I mean, and, and it's, but he died in a rock and roll circus kind of way in the sense that it fit into the uh, drug abuser uh, box. You know what I mean? Uh, it wasn't. Uh, what, what, how did he die? Well, he, he may have died that way. There's people that say he died that way. Sure. But, uh, you know, the doctor that attended said he died of a heart attack. And uh, there was, Jim was not a druggie. Right. You and know, you're saying drink was his, uh, that was what was going to kill him choice. if yeah. he had enough time. Yeah. But he also did everything to extreme. So if he did do a drug that was deadly, he might have done it to extreme. So I don't think it's impossible. Okay. But I always just kind of went with the doctor said he died of a heart attack. That makes sense to me. It all, none of us thought he'd make 30 because right. he lived such an extreme way. Wow. Uh, my last question is about Jim Morrison biographical thing, because I just don't know. His folks were, was, did he grow up in some, uh, how did he grow up? Was he in touch with his parents? Or? No, he was, oh. he was estranged from his parents. Okay. And we had a very funny scene in the first, when I was roadie, we did a show in Washington, D.C., and his mom came. And the managers were there for some reason. Right. And, uh, Sal and Ash, and they looked at me and said, do not let that woman anywhere near backstage. You must keep her out. Got it? I went, yeah, sure. So <laughs> I'm doing everything to deflect her while still getting the stage set up. It's funny already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was just, you know, he did not want to see her. Mm. And he did not want to talk to his dad. So that relationship was over in his brain. And uh, so he actually did the end original version with her in the audience and uh the place just i mean they didn't know she was in the audience sure we all were freaking out that he would sing that in, with his mom in the room it was pretty intense and then that night i left to go to the next town and as i drove through washington i had another kind of emotional epiphany because i realized our whole country's history is devoted to war it's all war memorials Everywhere you go, celebrate war. And I just thought, that's so wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and that was the time to maybe come around to those realizations as you were, America was in the middle of one of the most uh, intense wars of the modern era in terms of casualties, in terms of conscription. It was a, it was a brutal period. It was a horrible thing, and it's what really uh, ignited the counterculture. It's yes. what made us all go, screw the government, we don't trust anybody. I mean, it was very easy to stand on one side of that line. You know, to me, it was travel 7,000 miles to shoot somebody. Right. No, thank you. They're not threatening us. And I feel the same way today as we're in wars all over the world. When we come back, I want to ask you about some of the other artists you've worked with and uh, just about that world of rock and roll and music as it's changed to the years. Bill Siddons, our guest. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. I'm Kim McAllister on The Mark Thompson Show. Thank you for being with us. We will continue the interview with Bill Siddons in just moments. First, a reminder to click like and subscribe, subscribe if you could, here on The Mark Thompson Show. A Smash huge it thank with you. your iron rod. Thank you. Smash it indeed. Thank you for the $5 super sticker to BW Rock. So appreciate you contributing to The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, and you can do that if you would like to do it as well. The uh, super stickers and super 
chats are open. And of course, we are at themarkthompsonshow.com, themarkthompsonshow.com for Patreon and PayPal contributions. And now some news for you. The Michigan Supreme Court is ruling former President Trump can remain on the state's 2024 primary ballot. The court rejecting an appeal to kick Trump off the ballot using the insurrection clause. The special counsel prosecuting Trump for alleged election crimes wants to block the former president from making political attacks during the trial. Special counsel Jack Smith asking the court today to stop Trump's legal team from claiming the Biden administration directed any case to be brought against Trump for political reasons. Large group of protesters calling for a ceasefire in the Israel Hamas conflict snarled traffic on Century Boulevard in Los Angeles this morning, blocking the main entrance to LAX. 15 people detained, some for assaulting a police officer. There's a migrant caravan headed to the United States. It's now entered southern Mexico. Reports are thousands of migrants from Central and South America entered the Mexican state of Chiapas yesterday, some carrying a large banner that read, Exodus from Poverty. A surprise inspection at the Martinez Refinery uh, Company could last several weeks here in the Bay Area. That, according to the Contra Costa County health officials, the inspection coming over recent concerns about safety earlier this month, an operational incident triggered a nearby grass fire there. Microsoft and OpenAI being sued by the New York Times for copyright infringement. The lawsuit says the companies illegally used articles from the Times to help train chat GPT. The Times claiming Microsoft and OpenAI are responsible for billions of dollars in damages. Daihatsu, Japanese automaker owned by Toyota, stopped production in Japan after admitting it forged the results of safety tests on its vehicles for the last 30 years. And Tommy Smothers of the legendary Smothers what? Brothers comedy and music duo, yeah, has passed away. He died on Tuesday at the age of 86 following a battle with cancer. Tommy Smothers' brother, Dick Smothers, said he is forever grateful to have spent a lifetime together with him. This report sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards. Time to roll out uh, to Tenuta to get your wine for the new year. Taste test it. They've got 28 varietals. Give them 30 minutes and you will be friends for life. Check out Tenuta Vineyards. And if you say smash it with your iron rod, you get your 10% smash off. In- with your iron rod. Just like that. Get your 10% off in person or by ordering by phone at 925 699 4576 and make sure you say hi to Rich and Nancy out at Tenuta Vineyards. I'm Kim McAllister and this is The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Put it together for Bill Sims again. Come on. Come yeah, on. Here we go. That's all I'm talking about. So, Bill, uh, some of the other bands you've been involved with, um, you mentioned Robert Palmer. Um, I mean, I, as you mentioned, these different bands, CS and N, um, they were, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, would you call that folk rock? What was that at the time? How do they, or is it just called rock at the time, right? Well, I don't think we were as conscious of trying to divide it into, oh, this Genres. is jazz over here, this is folk rock. The music, I mean, if you look at so much of the music that happened in that era, sure, you know, traffic. Oh, right. What, was that rock and roll? I don't know. There were a number of bands like that mm-hmm. um, that that were all over the map musically. So it wasn't something that we really wanted to define it. But I would say to me as a fan, right. yeah, they were folk rock. They right. played acoustic guitars mostly, but they had this killer electric guitar player named Steven. Right. And uh, they... And the uh, harmonies were powerful in that band too. Absolutely. Yeah. And always were. Uh, and the reason I kind of asked about what you would call them is because the... It, it seemed like the world of rock was populated by a lot of different sounds. As you say, it, it there was, it, it felt uh, less segmented than it is. I mean, the, the Hendrix and um, uh, uh, <laughs> and the airplane and thank you, the Doors and uh, there's so many bands and all of them that lasted. The Stones, the Beatles, Zeppelin, everything from England. The stuff that lasted was completely unique in some way or another. There was a vocalist that sounded like no one else, production that sounded like no one else, uh, guitar players, uh, keyboard players, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. There was all this incredible variety of music that had a beat, which made it rock, 
I see. But most of the time, that beat was stolen from the blacks, you know, right. which is really more R&B in a lot of cases. Sure. So it was a very diverse, you know, and uh, you would listen to the radio, whether it was Top 40, uh, or it, everything sounded completely different from most everything else. And it wasn't until probably the mid 70s that the record companies got to the, well, it, they sound, they got three hits. We got to sound like them. And it started to become an ambition. And today, excuse my prejudice, I find that my, I listen to a lot of pop music and I am amazed at how I can barely tell it apart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, I think, creation of many hits that populate pop music now, that creation has been, and you'll pardon my bias, but corrupted by looking for the hook and the hook could be sent from like some artist in Seattle and they mix it with uh, something from a guy in Brooklyn and you know they what I mean? 20 writers on that yeah, song. Yeah, it's really, it's a little like what they've done with food. You know, they've created chemically the food that'll hit your taste bud a certain way and your craving another way. It's, you know, we've Frankensteined everything, including right, the absolutely. music. Well, yeah. you know, if you want to die young, eat in a restaurant every day because <laughs> it's all sugar and salt. Yeah. Every dish has got four times what you need to make it taste good. Uh, so when you look at the, t tell me some, just give me a, so I, when you look at this world of yours, I just see all these snapshots that I wish, cause I was just a kid listening to radio. I wish I had understood some of what went into these moments and these uh, songs. So Robert Palmer, when you were with Robert Palmer, cause I thought that was, that was also a cultural breakthrough. He had a look, he had a style. Oh, yeah. it, it was brilliant. It was almost, the, there was a theatricality to him. I did uh, the basically North American representation. I wasn't his manager, Davey Harper was, and Davey was my roadie for the Doors' first tour of Europe. And uh, we ended up in a fist fight, so we were bonded. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> What were you fighting over? Uh, I think he was fighting over not getting uh, the same hotel rooms that the band got, or something like that. I see. Okay. He was a you know a street fighter from uh, 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 Cockney. What is it? East uh, anyway. East End or something? Or yeah, East? yeah. And so, and he was just an in-your-face kind of guy, uh -huh. and almost unintelligible. But we, you know, we maintained a friendship for the next ten years, and I kept telling him, Robert is a million-selling artist. He just has never had the chance. You really need to hire somebody here to make that happen. Doesn't have to be me. I'm not advocating hire me. I'm saying you, for Robert, you need to hire someone who knows how this market works. And he said, yeah, 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 and blew me off. And we just laughed about it. And then one, uh, well, right, right, as Addicted to Love was just about to be released, um, the Riptide album, uh, I was in... Uh, london for thanksgiving and uh his uh, my first independent lawyer that just represented me and i was her second client her first client was ben sidron bill siddons was her second client That's she said I, mean. I have a very small file drawer <laughs> <laughs> but uh so we yeah emily was like a and still is a dear friend of mine so one night I, uh, I went, went to Emily's and Davey came over and we hung out and I did the same rant on him about you really need, Robert could break so big because he'd had like three consecutive under the radar, everybody loved this guy. Every name musician thought Robert Palmer was the bomb. He was just the best, but he sold 300,000 albums. And so... Um, January, Davey calls me and says, well, I've signed four other acts. I can't do all this work. The first rec the first single failed, Riptide. And he said, I need help. I said, I'm there. What do you want? He told me what he wanted, and we got to work. And <laughs> the, the, I mean, you, this all condenses down, right? There's sure. hours of talking about working with Robert. But uh, he... Uh, I was friends with a guy named Carter, and Carter was an A&R guy from San Francisco, and he was really close with Les Garland. Les Garland right. was the new head of MTV. 
Okay. Right? It was 84. Okay. And so, uh, no, 86. And so I go, well, I'm, I, I can't remember why I went to New York, but I'm, I'm in New York. I, I got to go see Les. So I went to Les's office and said, hey, Les, I just signed Robert Palmer. And he looked at me with his eyes bugging out saying, oh, man, do you, have you seen the video? I said, no, it's just I'm close with his manager. And he <laughs> called me and hired me for the U.S. And he says, watch this. And he reached over, grabbed a VHS, stuck it in his machine and looked at me and said, I'm going to play this a million times this year. Wow. And I said, well, then my work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it all be so easy. That was probably the most impactful video in the history of rock music, because he had those eight dancing girls, and right? The, you know the sleek model thing. It was the coolest visual anybody had ever seen, and it, and less to his word, played it until you hated it. That leads me to exactly what I wanted to ask you about Robert Palmer, which is there's the music, and then there's the style of the video which you just you said the exact thing i was going to say which is what blew him up was that look that style the theatricality as it was, was saying the only before. guy wearing a finely cut suit yeah. and a tie and uh yet it was he it, carved it was that place sexy. for himself yeah yeah and it was sexy without being overt right and then they hired this photographer in London to do the video, and the guy came up with the idea. So it was somebody else's idea. Yeah, it wasn't mine. He uh, he found a guy who came up with the idea to do this and did a great job, and we all couldn't stop looking at it, you know, because the girls were so aloof. Yeah. It and, was it was like uh, they pulled them off of Paris Fashion Week and yeah. put them in a video. It was brilliant. And, and, and that's kind of who he was. He enjoyed the finer things in life. Yeah. The first gig he did was in Boston. And uh, after the show, we were back in the hotel in the bar. And I just said to the waiter, whatever he's drinking, I'm paying. And so Robert looks over at me, waves, buys a $240 Armagnac. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started it, right? Right. Uh, I also think about bands like America. Um, I mean, they were another, was it Horse With No Name? Was there? That was the giant record, yeah. yeah. And, and in reality, I inherited America from Irving Azoff, who inherited it from Elliot Roberts. Even though they were, they were Elliot's client, Elliot was busy doing Neil and Joni and really didn't, have a lot of input and so uh when irving left irving took joe walsh but he didn't take america they were loyal to elliot and then my first day in the office i you know i had not made money for a year and a half i had a family and so i called david geffen and uh, geffen said would you be willing to work for somebody else i said yeah why he says i want you to go talk to elliot roberts i said okay why he says don't ask, just go talk to him. So I went and talked to Elliot, and I had just made a deal with Chris Blackwell to run uh, Island Artists for him in the U.S., not the label, but the management company. And uh, so I was destined to be Robert Palmer's manager somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was uh, Chris had just made a distribution deal for Island, and he really wanted to get Jerry and Herb a and M, uh, and show them how to be an artist label because they owned that turf. Yeah. And so he said, you know, that was A and M records, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they were just kind of blowing up as, uh, that label that had all the cool stuff on it and stuck with their artists. And they, they were the cool place you wanted to be. And, um, so Chris said, you know, I'd really rather not do this whole management thing for a few months, I want to get into place with, with the record company. I said, cool, whenever you're ready, I'm interested. And, uh, and literally the next day, I get the call from Geffen saying, I want you to take a meeting with Elliot, which is really what happened, because I'd worked with David on a couple other things. Actually, Post Doors, the Butts Band with Robbie John and Ray, and then mm -hmm. Ray left, and it was Robbie John and some English musicians. And um, Geffen... He, he had the lead, no, the lead singer was on Island, but we were talking to David uh, about doing the record deal. So 
Um, he called me and said, I want you to go meet Elliot. So sure, I went and met Elliot. And Elliot said, I got too much going on. I'm doing Neil and Joni. I've got America, Sal de Hilma Fure. I'm going to sign another big act soon. And uh, he had Ron uh, Stone working with him. And Ron was like his replica, the street kid from Brooklyn. And I'm the L.A. surfer guy, you know, culturally completely opposite. But it, what, what happened was simply that uh, Elliot said, here's a phone number, or here's the address. I want you to go over. This was on Tuesday because he, he made me the offer on Friday, and I spent the whole weekend trying to get a hold of Chris. Say, I don't want to do this if we're really going to do it. Right. Because Chris was what I really wanted to do. And um, so he uh, he never answered the phone. I had three different phone numbers for him. Uh, I called him 30 times, never got a response. And I just, I had to make a decision. And I needed to feed my family. And I went, you know, I have a job offer right in front of me. I have, you know, the right career move over there, but who knows? And how am I going to be a partner with a guy I can't get on the phone for days? Sure. So I took the job working for Elliot. And the first day of the job, he hands me a note with an address on it on Sweetser and says, America's doing rehearsals in this apartment. Go over, meet them, tell them you're the manager. I went, uh, okay. <laughs> and so I went, did, oh, and Beckley walks up to me and says, oh, so you're the manager of the month, huh? <laughs> I didn't have the history at that point to know that they'd been with Harlan and uh, uh, Harlan see. Goodman. And uh, anyway, they'd been with two other managers who had left eight months earlier. Irving came in, was there for six months. I came in, was there for six months. So I inherited him from Harlan and... Um, God, they went through managers. Hartman and Goodman, yeah. The, uh, I have to say, though, that... But they didn't They didn't want to go anywhere else. The manager dumped them No, it left. keeps going right. No, I'm not saying that they traded out. Yeah. Um, you're right. They didn't go through managers. It's just they were. They ended up... But with I was manager. the manager of the month. Yeah. And I loved them. Loved working with them. Uh, I The first thing, I, pu I put together a whole national promotion with Greyhound and Holiday Inns because the album was called Holiday and it was giving away oh, holidays sure. and all that stuff. And nobody at Warner's trusted me. They wanted to know that Elliot really would approve this because Elliot basically was known as Dr. No. He just said no I to see. most everything. I see. So they, they, they knew that if they, they ran it past him, he'd go, no. He might say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to promise with my hand on the Bible, no, this is approved. We can do this. So I had this whole campaign set up. We had two top 10 records off that album. And the first thing was a European tour. And uh, it was challenging because they were the most boring live act i'd ever seen and i had to they had such a great songbook but i guess oh, awesome and yeah. great guys yeah and so uh i could do that another hour and a half yeah. on them yeah and i'm still friends we we went to italy with dewey and penny that's uh, terrific a couple of few years ago and we see them a couple times a year but anyway um so you told them you have to i, I sat in a hotel room and and had an after show meeting and just said, look, I, I, what are you doing up there? And they said, we're making the best music we can. I said, I can hear that on the record. I came to see you live. Tell me how the song came about. Tell me anything. Talk to me. Make me feel like you know we're out there. Because they didn't say a word to the audience. So I was kind of beating them up, trying to get them to engage with an audience. And the second meeting in my room at 1130 at night, Elliot calls me and says, you got to come home. And I said, and the band was in the room. I said, well, that's, that's a problem, Elliot. You know, I've got, uh, I've got some really good stuff happening here. And blah, blah, blah. and he says, no, you got to come home. I said, why? He says, I signed the band. You have to represent them. I said, oh, oh. And the guys looked at me and said, okay, what's wrong? And I said, uh, Elliot needs me to come home oh, to wow. manage the band. And they landed in L.A. after that tour, went straight to the business manager and the lawyer, made sure they wouldn't drop them if they left Elliot. And they left Elliot. Wow. And, of course, I was with Elliot, so that wasn't really an option. And I'd only worked with him for two months at that point. So it was a short relationship. It's sad because yeah. you obviously really...
well, you so vibed with them that you're still in touch with and yeah. vacation with one of them. So Robbie, last... Ro- Robbie Robertson never calls me. Exactly. The best <laughs> band guys. You're gonna... uh, in our last minute, uh, Pat Benatar is a name that means something. You were with Pat Benatar for a hot second, but during the hot second, I mean, six I mean, months to manager, not actually with her romantically. No. Right? Uh, no. Six months. How did that happen? To, how did you end up with Pat Benatar's uh, uh, band? Uh, through uh, her uh, business manager um, and agent. I had Crosby, Stills, Nash with CAA, and uh, they had her, and Rob Light called me and said, uh, hey, you'd be interested in Pat? I said, love Pat. Sure. She's, she is great. Oh, by then, she'd already had Hit Me With she'd Your Best Shot and Hell is Her Chill. Yeah. real hits. Yeah. And uh, so, but her husband was very much in charge of things, and she had a, a kind of a personal assistant who was a manager who had managed that girl, had that song, Bitch. Mm. You'll tell me in a minute. But yeah. anyway, okay. uh, so she was kind of already surrounded. And I ended up having very little direct communication with Pat. You Meredith know, Brooks. This, yeah. Meredith Brooks, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Lori Levy was Meredith's manager, I think, after that. But she was, she was a pro, and she took really good care of Pat. Pat mm-hmm. loved her. So uh, they just, you know, and the husband was very controlling, so there just wasn't really the opportunity for me to build the relationship with Pat. And I made a couple of mistakes that came back to bite. Uh, one of them was not a mistake, which was that they, uh, the, we, had, we got the number one rock record with everybody lay down. Right. And uh, then the, the record that was the record was every time I fall back. It was, to me, it was going to be as big as Foreigner with their big ballads. It was just a great, great song, great vocal. And me and Daniel Glass, the head of the label, were just lined up to go for that song, that record. Mm -hmm. Pat and Neil had a different idea. I see. They had a song that they thought was the single, and I said, uh, yes, it sounds just like a single, but it's not emotionally compelling like every time i fall back god that's got to be hard to tell somebody that who's who cares oh, so it's much it's great about. we love it but yeah. and charles copham in the head of the label who had nothing to do with them but he loved that song so they wanted charles Koppelman to endorse it i knew daniel glass who was the head of promotion before he was the head of the label he knew what a record was and how to break it at radio and uh so daniel and i were conspiring to get um every time i fall back released Mm-hmm. And uh, they forced the hand and released the, the song that I've completely forgotten the title of. Yeah, so because it, it was a forgettable but yeah. lovely song. Sure, you know, and uh, and so right as uh, that song failed and we were going with every time I fall back and they fired me, oh. like, and Daniel no, I mean, and Daniel dropped the single and dro- dropped working the record because there was no direction. Very tough situation to be beat. Yeah. I, ha- I mean, you have to. I think one of the things that I learned just you know thinking about everything that you've done through the years and then settling it out you have to really handle some very prickly situations to smooth them out to aggressively handle them when a time when the time is right and to pull back on the aggression when the time is right i mean it's 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 pretty tricky i think i mean the, the reason i had any success is that i was always looking towards what will make the artist happier and better not richer necessarily and so you know, there were many times when the doors were about to break up, and I played a significant role in pointing the way to harmony. Sure. You know, I, think that, uh, I get, I get know. that. Now, radio is not uh, as possible as it used to be, right? Radio is fragmented, well, or is radio still important? It's just the, but... the contemporary audience that radio was driven by uh, now uh, spends at least half their listening time, uh, you know, on Spotify, Apple, or YouTube. Right. And therefore, the absolute power of radio has kind of gone away. It's still big. It's still free. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to pay $14 a month to listen to it. Sure. So it's still, uh, you know, you can't really have a huge record without radio. But you can have a lot of success without radio. Uh, you're so kind. I know I've kept you over time, so I'll let you go. But there's a lot of stuff we left out. And oh, so yeah. I hope you'll... Uh, the Crosby, Stills, and Nash, 15 years. I mean, I can't believe I left that out. I wish you hadn't said that. People are going <laughs> to go, what are you, you asking about? So I promise, Bill, before you go, you're moving away to Italy. 
I'm, uh, I, we have a house in Italy, and I'm hoping to spend much of the year there. Yeah. So you might have to come over and visit. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, and getting you back on sounds great, too. Uh, Bill Siddons, thanks, my friend. Bill Siddons, everybody. Yeah. Bye. 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 The Mark Thompson Show. I'm Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.